everyone. We're here today to talk about Math 121, Section 2.3, and this deals with graphs that either enlighten or deceive our audience. This is other types of graphs we'll take a look at. First, we'll start with a dot plot, which is a graph of quantitative values. They need to be numbers. It needs to be numerical data. It's got to be quantitative, in which dots are placed over a horizontal scale. Dots are placed over a horizontal scale. It's got two key features. The first is it displays the distribution. You can get an idea of the shape from the graph. Another key feature is you can recreate the original data, the original data set. That was not true for histograms or frequency tables, remember? They give you a class. The numbers could be any number within that class. Here we can look at what the original data was. In our example, we have pulse rates of males, and we've got a number line that goes from 40 to 110. And look, above 40 we've got a dot, here we've got a dot, 50, 52, 54, 56, 58, 60. So if I want to look at the number 60, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 dots above the number 60. That means in my data set I had 7 values for the number 60. If I want to look at the number 64, well it would be 60, 62, 64, there'd be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 data values for the value of 64. I can look at the data and we plot it by just putting dots above the number line where our data points fall. So if I wanted to add, let's say I took my own pulse right now and I got, let's say I got 74. I'd go over here to 74 and I'd put a dot at the top, right? Notice we stack the dots vertically. This has kind of like an up shape, then a big dip, then some up, and then some tail off to the right, right? It's all over the place. Pulse rate's a little sporadic, right? It's not a nice, clean graph. Now next is a stem and leaf plot. This is a graph of quantitative data. Quantitative quantitative data for which each data value is separated into two parts, a stem and a leaf, for which each data value is split into a stem and a leaf. And we'll talk about exactly what that looks like when we get down to our example. Features, it shows the distribution, shows the distribution, distribution. You can see the shape. It also allows you to recreate the original data, recreate the original data. That's another key feature, right? You can recreate the original data. It also sorts the data nicely for us sorts the data is another key feature here. It, the data is sorted in a stem and leaf plot. And let's take a look at what they actually look like. Let's take a look here. If I notice, I've got this vertical bar here, which I'm going to draw in red just so we can more clearly see it. And I've got four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten on the left side. Then on the right side, in the first row I have zero and two. This tells me, if we look right here, the numbers 40, and 42 both showed up. If I look at the 5, there's a 0, a 0, a 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, and then 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 6, 6, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8. What this tells me is I have data points of 50, 50, 52, 52, 52, 52, 52. You smash the stems and the leaves together to get your data. These are the leaves. These are the stems the stems and leaves, you smash them together or split them apart when you're creating, right? If I wanted to add another value to it, let's say I took my pelts and I've been working out, I get 106. Well, down here at 10, 
So if I want to add 106, I would put a 6 here in the 10 row, right? That would be 106. That's how I would show 106. So stem and leaf plots allow us to look at numbers as a stem and a leaf. And notice everything's sorted. The higher numbers are at the bottom, the lower numbers are at the top. If I want to look at the shape of the data, I can turn the graph sideways. And I see that it nice has a nice peak up in the middle somewhere. It shows me the shape, right? It lets me recreate the original data, and it sorts the data. That's a stem and leaf plot. These two graphs are usually used when you want to make quick decisions in statistics. If you want to quickly look at the distribution, you can make a dot plot. If I'm being honest, I use dot plots whenever I give an exam. I always put the data in a dot plot. That way I can see, was there a big cluster around a certain grade? Where's the outliers? I can look at the distribution. I can see where the data falls, right, quickly. It's really quick to make a dot plot, just bing, bang, boom, boom, boom. You put dots where the numbers fall, right? Same with the stem and leaf plot. It's a fairly quick graph to make and allows you to make some quick decisions about some distribution sort of questions, right? So we've got those two graphs. We also have a time series graph. So a time series graph shows quantitative data is a graph that shows changes in quantitative data, quantitative data over a period of time. And that is the key feature. It reveals trends over time. It reveals trends in relation to time. Trends in, <coughs> excuse me, relation to time. It shows trends in relation to time. Let's look at our example. It says the year, it goes from 1985 to a little past 2010. It says law enforcement fatalities. And if I look, this graph, if I tried to draw a line that hit all the dots, I might draw this line, right? If I'm trying to draw a line that shows the general shape, they're kind of going in a downwards direction, right? However, there's a peak right here. What was going on right here? If I follow it down, that happened just after the year 2000. This is an outlier, right? Something happened in the year 2000, the September 11th attacks. There was a larger than average amount of law enforcement fatalities that year. It was an outlier, right? That's not something that we typically see. It was a once in a lifetime event, right? Overall, the trend is downwards. However, we might have data points that stand uniquely above the rest, right? So we can be aware of those things, right? We know things about time, right? We know what happened in given years. Maybe we want to ask ourselves, why was this year so far down? This one right here in, um, you know, it's after 2010, maybe it's 2011, maybe it's 2012. What happened that year? Why was that the lowest point? We might want to ask ourselves those questions as well. We can reveal trends over time. Now we've got a bar graph. Bar graphs show are a type of graph, right? But they're for categorical or qualitative data. Is a graph of qualitative data. If it's numerical data, you should use a histogram instead of a bar graph. This is for categories, for categorical data. That's the feature, is it allows you to use categorical data, allows the use of categorical data. That's the main feature. It allows the use of categorical data and shows the distribution, right? And shows, you know, where the clumps are, where's the clusters, things like that. So it allows us to use categorical data. It allows us to compare. Let's look at our example. We've got stolen boats and we've got different types of boats. It says jet ski, motorboat, fishing boat, inboard boat, and sailboat. If I look at the different categories, jet skis are stolen the most, sailboats are stolen the least, and then things in between are stolen a little bit less frequently, right? Why would jet skis be the most frequently stolen type of boat? Well, let's think about it. Let's think why does that make sense? Well, they're small, right? People might be able to more easily put them into a truck or more easily wander off with them, right? Whereas a sailboat, a sailboat is difficult to 
operate, right? It requires knowing how the sails work. It requires knowing how to tie certain knots. It requires knowing some nautical experience. Much more difficult to steal a sailboat than a jet ski. So we can draw some conclusions from this. We can make conclusions based on the data. We can compare categories. It allows us to get some better inference of what is going on, right? So that's bar graphs, categorical data, right? Bar graphs. If you have numbers, use a histogram, though. If you have numerical data, use a histogram. If you got quantitative data, use a histogram. So a bar graph is a graph of qualitative data. We use bar graphs for qualitative data, right? Same for pie charts. Pie charts is a circular graph for qualitative data. The main feature of a pie graph or a pie chart, the main feature is the amount of times this format is used. This is an extremely common format. Its feature is an extremely common format. Most people see pie charts in their day-to-day -day lives, right? We see pie charts on the news, in the internet, on social media. We see pie charts a lot, right? We see pie charts all the time. Because, look at this one here. We've got this big slice for jet ski, right? Notice the little dotted line here. Maybe you want to exemplify it with a red pen. But jet ski is the biggest slice, right? And then motorboat, utility, inboard, and sailboat. Each slice, the percentage of space this slice takes up represents the percentage of the data that fell in that category. So jet skis are a little less than 50%, right? At almost 50% of the shape. Motorboats are a little more than 25%. It's a little bit bigger than a quarter of the shape. Utility boats might be a little bit around a 10%. Inboard might be 5%. And sailboat is almost negligible, right? It's a very small wedge for sailboat, which matches exactly this bar chart here, right? The percentages for the data match how large the wedge should be. So when you know what percentage of the data falls in a category, you know how large that wedge should be. And then we can draw them appropriately, right? So that's five graphs that you've probably seen most of those before, right? Those probably aren't new to you. Frequency tables, histograms, probably fairly new. Pie charts, bar graphs, time series graphs, stem and leaf plots and dot plots. You've probably seen at least one of those in the last week of your lives outside of this class. You might have seen a, you know, a bar graph on the news talking about the election or a pie chart on the news talking about, you know, different subcategories of consumers. You never know what you might see in a graph, right? But we do know that there are some common formats we want to be aware of. And those are the five I wanted to touch on. Now, what about graphs that are trying to deceive the audience? These are graphs you should avoid, and you should be aware of them when you see them in the news or in social media. You should be aware of deceptive graphs. The first type of deceptive graph is a non-zero vertical axis. We should always scale the vertical axis from the value of zero upwards. Remember in histograms, we kind of used that little lightning bolt number to skip on the horizontal axis, right? We did not do it on the vertical, only on the horizontal. Never skip numbers on a vertical axis because it's deceptive. These two graphs tell me the same information. In the one on the left, notice it starts at 10%, then it's 12, 14, 16. It starts at 10% and goes up to 24%. The one on the right starts at 0, 5, 10, and goes up to 25. This placebo is at 11%, and Oxycontin is at 23. In this graph, Oxycontin is around 23, and the placebo is around 11. These graphs tell me the same exact thing, but they're deceptive. In this graph, it looks like Oxycontin is way more effective than the placebo was. Whereas in this graph, it shows that it was only twice as effective. This is the better choice. Better. This is deceptive. And you should be aware of why. Hopefully that makes sense, right? 
This one is intentionally making the placebo bar look smaller than it actually is by starting at 10%, so the placebo is only one tick up. You should always start at zero on your vertical bar. Always start at zero. Always avoid skipping numbers on your vertical axis. Now, maybe you turn on the news after watching this video and you see a election chart that does the same thing. It shows Biden versus Trump or Trump versus Biden and it starts at a non-zero number. It might start at 40%. That's to exacerbate the differences. If you turn on Fox News, they might be more inclined to show a misleading graph that favors President Trump. If you turn on MSNBC, they might be more inclined to show a misleading graph that favors Joe Biden. We should always be truthful in our graphs. Always start at zero. Never try and mislead your audience. Never be deceptive, right? Always be truthful with the data. Now, the next type of deceptive graph we want to talk about is pictographs. Pictographs use two or three dimensional pictures to represent data, which is one dimensional. So pictographs use pictures to represent data. The issue is pictures are two-dimensional. I'm going to write two-dem for two-dimensional or three-dimensional, right? When you draw a picture, it's either two-dimensional or three-dimensional, right? If I look at these cigarettes, they're a two-dimensional drawing, aren't they? Whereas data is whereas data is one-dimensional. Data values usually go up or down. And let's talk about that in relation to this example. Here it says 1970, 37% of US adults smoked. And then I took the data again in 2013. What were the possibilities for this number? It could have gone up or down, right? It could not go any other direction. It could either increase or decrease. Those are the only options. It can't go anywhere else. Turns out it decreased to 18%. And here's one cigarette to show the number of adults who smoked. And here's another cigarette to show the number of adults who smoked. These numbers are about half or double of each other, depending on your perspective, right? 18 is about half of 37, or 37 is double 18. This picture here takes up way more than double the area of this cigarette. It actually takes up almost four times as much area. If you tried to paint it, it would take you a lot more paint to paint this one than this one. A lot more than just double. It's misleading. It is misleading. It's using a two-dimensional picture. A cigarette is two-dimensional, right? To represent a one-dimensional object, the data. If you tried to draw this in 3D, you know, if we put a nice little, like, you know, we put some nice little circles on the ends and we get a nice little rounded end here and made them a 3D picture, the difference is even more exacerbated. This cigarette has eight times the volume as this cigarette. It's not eight times the data, though. Pictures mislead us. So avoid pictographs. Pictographs in general are misleading. Sometimes, very rarely, they can be correct, right? Sometimes, but very rarely. Almost always, pictographs are used in a misleading manner or in an uneducated manner. Perhaps the person presenting the data didn't know pictographs were misleading. They thought it was more eye-catching and more interesting to look at than just the numbers, right? However, a lot of times, if you find yourself trying to make something more interesting looking without using just the data, you're going to be misleading. You're uh, putting appearances into the play when it should just be the data making all of the decisions, right? Statistics is all about the data. We should not try and mislead or deceive our audiences. So those are two types of deceptive graphs. You should avoid or be suspicious of information that relies on those types of graphs because it's trying to mislead you. It's trying to be deceptive, right? Whether willfully or not is another question, but deception is at hand, right? And that brings us to the end of 2.3. Thank you for tuning in, and I will see you next time.